practicing uh, I don't know what page it is, but it's basically right after you break the matzah in half, then you come up to the passage which says, this is the bread of affliction. It's in Aramaic. I'll read the phrase. This is the bread of affliction. The achala of Astana Ba'ara the Mitzrayim. That are, yes. In my Magana, I don't know if it's in others, but certainly in other places, it says, this one says, Harini Lupan Mizuna Kayashet Pasar the Taperit, yes, that's right. So, yeah. where, did, where is the, what is the origin of that? And is that the one here, or is that in your own Haggadah as well? Or where, isn't that for other Kiddushes or something? So, so the idea is, you're right, you know, I skipped a little bit, but the idea is that the telling, every time there's a mitzvah, the Hasidic is a Hasidic practice. The Hasidim don't just rush in to do the mitzvah, they they prepare for it spiritually. So those words are, behold, I'm going to fulfill the mitzvah now, each time they, before you do a mitzvah, they say it. So the there is a mitzvah of telling the story of Egypt, telling the Exodus story. I was, uh, they have a lot of pages on it here, but I wasn't, I, um, I wasn't focused on it because I was thinking um, that maybe we go straight to the Halach Ma'anya, but I'll just say very ba basically the, the mitzvah of telling the Exodus story is a biblical commandment. And as it states in the Torah, the Galatel Abincha Bayomahu, you have to tell the next generation on that day. And even nowadays, where there's no mitzvah to bring a carbon Pesach, to bring a Pesachoam, there's a mitzvah to Matzah, and the mitzvah of telling the story of Exodus is a biblical commandment. Um, so Maimonides writes, there's a positive command from the Torah to tell about the miracle that God did for our fathers in Egypt, specifically on this night. And it says, remember the day that God led you out of Egypt, and, and specifically. And it's not specifically to the children, but even between one person and his fellow friend, even to oneself. My wife told me, that they say talking to yourself is not bad. It's when you answer yourself. That's the problem. <laughs> I don't think she was joking. Uh, um, but there is a mitzvah if you're, if you're for some reason, eating this Seder by yourself. And if anybody here is planning that, then talk to me. And I, even though I won't be here, I'll be happy to, uh, you know, to connect you with some people who will be very happy to host. But if for some reason you're eating by yourself, maybe prefer it. So still... There is a uh, specific mitzvah to tell over the story. Um, okay. And this is the idea that why there are four children mentioned in the Agada, because each one has to go in, in, to, to tell the story in uh, in their own way. So, so the okay. There's a lot more to discuss about this mitzvah. Maybe after we finish the Agada, we'll come back to talk about this in more depth, because I wanted to talk about this next this next passage of the Agada, which is that you say, Halach Ma'anya. Some have the phrase, this, this is the bread of affliction. Some say, you don't say Halach Ma'anya, you say, but this is like the bread, meaning to say that this is not the actual bread that our forefathers ate, but this is like the bread. And so, uh, um, so you could say either one. So basically, after you break the matzah and you put away the larger piece for the afikomen, then you take, you put the, the broken piece on the plate and and you say, this is the bread of the poor. This is the bread of the poor that our forefathers ate when they were in Egypt. Whoever is hungry and he has nothing to eat, let him come forward and eat. The Kol Ditrich, anybody who needs something and he doesn't have the needs of Pesach, like Matzah, Haroses, Maror, Yai, and the four cups, Ye Sevi Yifsach, let him come with us and do the Pesach Seder. Hashat Hacha, this year we are the this year we are here. Uh Lashana Bab our the Israel. Next year in the land of Israel. Hashata Abde, this year we are slaves. Next year, let the Mashiach come and redeem us, and so that we should all be free without any servitude. So, uh, there's so much to talk about this. Um, let's start, first of all, anybody have any questions before we start? 
Yes, Mordechai. <laughs> I know we need that. <laughs> God willing, next next week when I come back, we'll have the fresh soup every day. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What? Yeah. Oh, I said because this is a mitzvah. Oh, okay. Okay, so so now okay, so what's the reason why we say this phrase at the beginning of the Haggadah? There's a lot of uh, there's a lot to talk about this phrase. There's a lot of there's a lot to talk about. Why do we say this phrase at the beginning of the Haggadah? So the Rashbam writes, it's to tell the children the reason why we broke the matzah in half, because we just broke it in half. Like, uh, and we're telling them that we're doing like a poor person. And so therefore, since our, four, our, our, our ancestors, when they were in Egypt, they would eat like a poor person, person in a big rush. And they would quickly divide it up. And you said, quickly, if you don't have enough, uh, take some of mine. So basically, this answers a lot of questions. What we're what we're doing here is we're not really inviting because most people in America, when they eat their seder, they're uh, they're eating it in with their door closed, their windows locked, the front door locked, and they're and now unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever I'm saying, because of the times we're in with the gun, you know, a lot of people I know have gotten guns recently. So so. And now you say that anybody who comes and wants to eat doesn't make sense. But what Rashbam is saying is, no, we're acting out the way the poor people of our ancestors did it in Egypt. This is the bread. And what would they do? They'd say, oh, you want some? You want some? You want some? And when they were in the darkest days, that they would be handing out the bread to each other, the broken pieces. That's what Rashbam says. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, we're doing the Haggadah. The holiday of Pesach is coming. We just passed over the holiday of Purim. Here, here, you know what? Maybe, Jeff, do you mind um, putting those all together so at the end, so people, when they come in, can get some? Here. All right. Perfect. 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 Oh, no, he's got it. He's got it here. He's next to me. I keep it next to me. Okay. So the, the, the that's from Rashbam. Rashbam is Rabbi Samuel Ben Mayer. He was Rashi's grand. Oh, no, no. That's not our brother. That's, give me that. That's uh, David's. Uh, thanks. The Rashbam is uh, um, what is that, Akiva? Cider. Oh, okay, cool. From the fridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he brought it on Purim. Yeah. yeah. Now Ravan, Ravan was a German authority in the um, 12th century. He writes that we we start at the beginning because the children are waiting for the Manashtana. So we want them to know that in the future we're going to eat the Manashtana. So therefore, we say now so that they'll know. That they'll know what's coming. The Rash, the Rashbats writes that we start with Halach Ma'anya because what they start to do back in the time in the Mishnah was said that they first remove the table. And uh, that's what the Mishnah says. You remove the table and you tell the story of the Exodus. You remove the table and you tell the story of the Exodus. So the children are going to ask. Do we already eat that you're getting rid of the table? And so we have to answer them. We say, no, that uh, this is not our food. This is the bread of affliction. And that's what our forefathers say. Meaning we are imagining a conversation here. And a question, Jeff? Another explanation is by the Siach Yitzchak. He writes that we have to say this prior to the Manashtana because they're concerned and maybe the children will fall asleep before their big moment of saying the Manashtana and then they won't hear the Exodus. And so therefore, this is like a mini Haggadah. <laughs> you can get the whole Haggadah right here. Like, okay, if you only have patience, like for two minutes, like you might have something like that at your Seder, here it is. All right? It tells the whole story. Yeah, it's exactly the TikTok Haggadah. Exactly right, Elon. Now? I think. No, no, like in, when we could, obviously, like in the Rechiyo. Um. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Not only that. If you don't eat the carbon pesach, 
then it's a positive, one of the two positive commandments that if you don't do, you're liable for the Kari's penalty. Yeah, it's equivalent to not getting a circumcision. It's like you have to get a bris. I think they, I think that they're, they haven't had a problem yet in terms of we haven't had yet the Paschal Lamb, so I think they'll worry about it when it happens. Yeah. What's, what's the other one? A bris, if you don't circumcise yourself. If you don't circumcise yourself. What? I'll take <laughs> no, you, you, it's not one or the other. The Barbanel writes, uh, Barbanel is the uh, four, uh, four, I mean, 15th century Spanish authority. He writes that since we invite poor people to come and eat with us, therefore we don't want them to be embarrassed. So we say, oh, we're all poor tonight. You see what a sweet answer, mm -hmm. meaning to say you have the poor people at the stater, and you're like, and and you don't want them to feel like, like they're any less of a Jew. So tonight we're all poor. It's a very interesting approach. I uh, I really want to encourage everybody to just say that it's very important. Everybody knows that on Purim there's a mitzvah to give money to the poor, but it's also a mitzvah to give money to the poor for Pesach. And when you sit at your seder, Maimonides writes, or I'm right, if you sit at your Pesach meal and your festival holiday and you spend whatever you spend, $100, $500, $1,000, $5,000 at a hotel and you want to go to a hotel for Pesach, it's $5,000 a person, maybe more, $6,000, $7,000 a person. Whatever you spend, I'm not telling you how to spend your money, but what I am saying is that it's a part of the mitzvah of Pesach is to give to the poor, what's called ma'uslitim, money for the wheat. So you have to give, we all have to give poor people food for Pesach. So there are different ways you can do this. The local charity that I respect and I give to is the Yad Yehuda because they, that's a kosher food pantry. So I'm sure their needs are going to be enormous before Pesach to giving people who need money. Okay, the Kisav Sofer, okay, he writes that what he writes that the nature of man is that he's usually not satisfied what he with what he has, and also the nature of man is that he it's hard for him to give to others, and so therefore, the before we invite the poor person, we say this is the bread of affliction, meaning to say that we have to remind ourselves of the bread that we didn't have it. So in Egypt, our forefathers were pushing themselves to just to eat this bread, and also we'll feel the um, the pain of the poor person. And we could say, with happiness. Oh, So the whole purpose of why we say this is the bread of affliction is because we think is because we're not focused. We're, we're, it's to remind us to be grateful for what we have. Give us some perspective on our own existence. Say, remember when we had it back then, uh, they had it worse. And also also remember how, how worse off we could have it it's to give us this, this idea. Okay, one more answer. Why we, one more explanation of why we say this at the beginning of the Agada. The Maise Hashem writes, I'm not even sure what that is, that it was that this that this was established after the destruction of the second temple when they wanted to fulfill the mitzvah of telling the story of Exodus. And they remembered that when the temple was standing, and lo binyamin, lo binyamin, I have one more thing to tell you. These outlets don't work either. Oh, you noticed it all? Is that a big problem? All right, we'll have to discuss this. Yeah, well, we, 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 but anyway, in the meantime, we are doing the Agada. You're welcome. Are, are you able to stay or? Yeah. The Agada, I don't know if it's in the sitter. It's over here. Oh, Moshe, Benjamin here. Join us. Akobi, join us. Pull up Agada, join us. They're over there at the end. Here, with our goddess, they're at the end. We're, we're right at the very beginning. We're discussing. Here comes it right here, Moshe, Kobe. Now you see, I here I was thinking I was uh I, I was doing something wrong, but now it turns out we didn't we didn't do anything wrong yesterday. Sam and Jeff and I were trying to figure out the the outlets. It turns out we didn't do anything wrong. It was a problem that was beyond our skill set. Okay. Shekoyach. You see, it's always, you need everybody to be in the yeshiva. You especially need a, a person who knows electricity because, hello, it's time here, grab Agada, because 
if you have electricity, oh, if you have electrician, he brings the sparks. Uh, uh, he brings the light. He brings the light. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a, a Rebbe joke, right? Okay, so so the might uh, uh, idea was instituted of saying halach ma'ayad. We're saying at the very beginning of that God that why we start by saying this is the bread of affliction was instituted at the very beginning of the right after the destruction of the African temple. They want to fulfill the mitzvah of telling the story, and they remember that at the time of the temple they used to gather there all the neighbors and they would do the carbon pesach together. That's how they used to do it in the time of uh, in the time of the temple. Everybody would gather and do it. But now they're in exile. There's no carbon pesach. Everybody looks at like ourselves like we're individuals. We're all alone. We're cut off from each other. We're not together. We can't do the carbon pesach. We're we lost out the temple. You can imagine. Then everybody had to register, like Rabbi Steinholz tried to do a few years ago, to bring the carbon pesach. But now we can't do anything. And so therefore, they sing this as a uh, uh, as a uh, dirge, they started to chant in a, in a in a sad tone. This is the bread of affliction. You know, we're 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 afflicted. We can't observe our Pesach, uh, and and this is not like where we used to have the biggest parties in the world. This is a time of affliction, of mourning, and that's what our father. We're basically back to our exile in Egypt. And now anybody who wants to, in this meal, in the time of the Paschal Lamb, in order to come, you had to register beforehand. You had to like get a wedding invitation. You had to RSVP. But now anybody who wants to could show up. It's not a good thing. And so therefore, and this is, uh, and then we say, May next year we have together the uh, Gu'ula, the redemption. This is the explanation of the Maise Hashem. A very, very creative explanation. See, I just love this. We've been reading this passage my whole life. We just saw seven new explanations that uh, many of us might not have heard before. Now, there is a practice. Who has this practice in your Seder? To lift up the Seder plate when you say, this is the bread of affliction. Why do you do that? Why do you do that? So the Shulchan, uh, the Rosh writes that. What's the reasoning? So, so what's the reasoning? So we found five reasons for this. What are the reasons? First of all, Always the go-to one on Seder night. You want the children to see. Number two comes from the Ravya. The Ravya is the, uh, the German uh, authority in the 12th century. Uh, he writes, uh, it's to show joy. <laughs> Meaning like when we lift up the cups. Rashi lived from 1040 to 1105 in Troyes, in the Champagne region, but he did study in Varms and Mainz. But the Ravya was Rabbi Lezer ben Yol Alevi. I believe he died. he was born in the late 12th century and maybe died. You could look up his dates. No, it's like 200 years after Rashi. So uh, late 12th century. I, I think he was born in the late. Yeah, I think he was. Yeah, but I think that was when he was born and he lived till. Uh, like, so um, so he writes that it's for joy. By the way, we're seeing two exact opposite approaches of what this this phrase is. Is it for joy? Is it for sadness? The Leka Yosher uh, writes that the Truma Shadesh, and Truma Shadesh is 15th century or uh, Austrian, he writes uh, um, that when he when he started to say Halach Ma'anya, he would pick up the plate and would put it down before he, he would pick it up, put it down, start saying Halach Ma'anya, and then put it down before he finished. Uh, <laughs> so he wants to show everybody to see it. He wants everybody to see what he's doing to show how much love he has for the mitzvah. How much he's doing the mitzvah with such joy. Um, Don't we usually okay. challah when we say amotzi? Hold on one second. Yosef, is that his name? Yes, Rabbi Yosef, what are you saying? I asked if we don't usually lift the, the, the challah when we say amotzi. No, so maybe it's like that. Uh, let's see. Hold on. Uh, um, they don't. They don't give that answer here, but I don't have a problem with it. I don't have an objection to it necessarily. Uh, but I've seen people make up the whole uh, the whole mitzvah. The whole uh, like four. Yeah. yeah. So um, the sefer in Hagim writes that lift up the matzah and say this. Um, and he writes that 
And that is to be able to speak about it, meaning to say that we're, I guess, it shows the connection between what we're saying and the plate. We wouldn't necessarily be aware that we're talking about it. And one more answer is, this is a hint to the fact that we were low down in Egypt and now we're being elevated. Uh, now, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of pages here about how high you have to pick it up. I'm going to skip those because I'm going to let anybody tell them. Oh, you have to pick it up. Do you have to pick it up like here or just a little bit? I think it's amazing that we found out we had to keep the matzahs on the Seder plate. No Seder plate that I know these days has matzahs. I have one which has it on it. I have. I'm going to put my matzahs on it this year and, you know, find a slot. I have a Seder plate with matzah in it. Yeah. Have you ever had a Seder That's where someone didn't spill one of the cups of wine? <laughs> I've never had one where no one spilled one. Okay. See, uh, I, it's the question whether you can make it past the first cup without spilling. You know what? Well, once I brought this, once I brought up this topic about how high, I feel like it would be disrespectful to that lacha to not say it. So I'm going to talk about it. Okay, Benjamin, thank you. We'll talk. You'll tell me what we need to do. I say it's not a real Haggadah unless it's got like wine stains all over it. So the. Um, so the um, the Meiri writes that you have to lift it up to the shoulder, shoulder, shoulder height. Sounds right. Okay, that reminds us that they lifted it up. They put it on their shoulders. Uh, Mata, the, they put mats on their shoulders. Yeah, in Egypt, that they, when they carried it out. The Seder Ayom writes that he heard from a great rabbi, uh, a Kabbalist. Uh, and and he heard that you should take the plate and uh, oh, this is, I'll read it. He says he heard from a Chacham Akubo on a different arrangement to the Seder plate. He said that you should have 12 things on the Seder plate, not like we have there. What do we have there, seven or eight? He said you should have 12 things. And when you come to Halach Ma'anya, he should put the plate where? On his head. And he should stand up uh, at, on his feet like somebody wants to walk, and then after, uh, uh, and after he finishes it, he should uh, put that seder plate on the heads of everybody else who's there. And and the seder yom writes, uh, he never saw anybody else do this, but since he said it, uh, if you do it, you have a loft, meaning you're okay. You All right. everything and then you cover it, is what you say. I don't know. He says, listen, I never saw this, but if you did it, it's not the worst thing in the world. Maybe you should bring that to the family, say it. I, I want to say that, you know, you have to be very careful about introducing new practices because one time we went to my aunt's for Pesach and she said at Dayenu, she took out scallions and she said, when you say Dayenu, there's a custom some communities have to Hit the person with the scallions. The problem is when you give scallions to little kids, which I was at the time, and you say, hit the sibling next to you, you've been waiting your whole life for this moment. So. <laughs> okay, Rabbi Benjamin of Mitudela, and he traveled, he was a traveler. He says that the Jews of North Africa and specifically of Tunisia, uh, um, he said that they had this practice. Uh, um, and they said, anybody who never put the Seder plate on his head would never have success in life. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you could, this, is, this is something that you could discuss at your Seder. You could raise a question. Who can name the weirdest Seder practice? <laughs> The Chida writes that when he was in Tunisia, he was from Europe, though, right? The Chida lived in Turkey, I believe, before moving to Jerusalem. But he says that when he was in Tunisia, uh, um, the person who was like the waiter uh, uh, put like waved the Seder plate above the heads of the people three times. And he asked the Chida, should I also wave it over the women's heads? So the Chida answered, only wave it over the men 
but not over the women. Um, it's in Bosch, right? Yes, he said, because the verse says, Rachem Rachamatayim or Rosh Gever, meaning only over the head of a man, based upon the verse in Shoftim chapter 5, verse 30. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> Eliezer, we got bad news. Binyamin checked the outlets and he says they're burnt. The burnt house. I, I don't know what that means, but it doesn't sound good. <laughs> no, it means you're going to replace place. Yeah, oh, okay. views? No, not the views. The, 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 uh, the the motion. Expensive. expensive. Yeah, I mean, not that expensive. You can get them. Well, we'll talk. We'll talk about it after. We'll figure it out afterwards. We have one more practice, and that is. Oh wait. Uh, I'll do this in the old pray. The Getter Shame Tov brings this custom that. Um. Hold on, Aviva, maybe you could take a picture of all of us studying. It's such a beautiful feeling that I have right now, being able to study with everybody. You get us all in it's such a tremendous opportunity. He writes, the Keter Shem Tov, but then how are you going to be in it? Sorry. You don't need it. You don't need it. We'll get you in the next one, Aviva. We'll get. We'll make you a star in the next one. Okay. The Keter. I want to be in Okay, here, Deborah too. Here. I want to be You're in it now, Deborah. You're in it, Deborah. Take a picture of the phone. <laughs> you got it. You got it, Avina. Okay. The Keter Shem Tov, and then we'll dive in. He brings at this cost. He brings this custom, and he writes that um, when you take the plate and you wave it three times, you should say, "This year we are slaves. Next year we will be free in Jerusalem." And he asked the rabbis of Morocco. Kobe has a grandma from Morocco. What's the reason? And they said they believe that the waving of the Seder plate will protect them from all afflictions uh, and that the blessings will come upon them. And so and so the children will say, why are you doing this? And then we could say, we're doing this to establish all the miracles uh, in our, to, to talk about the miracles. Okay, my friends, I just want to say before we stop, okay? And also everybody should, um, if I have not